Oh, I'm going to get pestered with uh, mosquitoes around here. Uh, so what Gary Harbottle says about this is that a most obvious ruin in front of the active Chiang Kham, uh, the temple that uh, I was so stuck with, the grass area between the two is reminiscent of a traditional English village green surrounded by trees. It appears to serve a similar purpose for Wei and Kung Kham, current residents. It is frequently used for village fairs, festivities and celebrations. I'm going to move on for a bit because uh, there's so many mosquitoes around here. It's uh, in this little uh, woodland here uh, next to the water. Obviously uh, mosquitoes lay their uh, eggs and uh, then the nymphs grow up in the water. So there's plenty of mosquitoes here. But you can see uh, that it uh, is a ruin. It is below ground level. Uh, it was excavated uh, in 2002 apparently. So when Gary Harbottle Johnson did his first run through here, uh, late 1990s uh, through early 2000, he saw it in its various stages of excavation. Got to watch this place as well, it's Pooh Corner as well. well. This is where I got stuck for so long in uh, what Chiang Kham, or what's better known as what Canton site 18 and uh, I'm, not, I'm not going back in otherwise I might get um, drawn back in and uh, never never released again but just outside the entrance is uh, this area which uh, Gary Harbottle Johnson in his book uh, talks about being a little bit like a little village green which is used for markets and festivals and uh, just celebrations of sorts just outside the, the main temple. So about decap well, to get back to what Gary Harbottle Johnson was saying, uh, in the ruins that uh, have been excavated, uh, there's a, a Lana style Vihan and a Chedi base uh, are in normal configuration with a north south alignment. Although its original name is unknown, it now carries the name Wat Tat Noi and has been dated to the 14th to 15th centuries. So that's 13 to 1400s AD which puts it in the era uh, of Meng Rai's grandchildren and great-grandchildren and belies uh, the tourist industry myth that Meng Rai abandoned the city after it, irrep yeah, after it flooded, irreparably flooded. There is more support for his abandoning Lampun due to flooding and that's uh, something covered on page 11 in this book. Fascinating book. It's such a shame it's out of print now. Possibly due to its accessibility and proximity to the vi village green, there is a lot of evidence of damage to the site caused by pedestrians, especially in the tops of the walls and on the edges of steps. When you are visiting any of the city's locations, please be aware that brickwork is rarely cemented into place and that even the most careful explorer can dislodge some of the restoration work, which is subject to quite extreme weather. And this was as Gary Harbottle saw it. So as you can see, the ground level that I am stood on at the top uh, would have covered uh, the base of the Fahan and uh, maybe the base of the Chedi at the far end until it was uh, pulled back and uh, excavated by the Fine Arts Department. And here it's saying that this monastery uh, is situated in the former town of Wien Kung Kham, immediately west of Wat Chang Kham. Excavations reveal that the base of the stupa and the base of the Wihan uh, have typical Lana architectural features. The monastery dates from around <laughs> 1250 to 1450, so a 200 year period. Its former name is unknown, but at present it's called Wat Tat Noi, Monastery with a Little Stuba. Let's have a look at this uh, QR code up here. Well, this QR code, I've just scanned it, and it's taken me off to uh, a, a, a blank page, so unfortunately I can't link to that. It's been attacked or severed, maybe by these red ants devilish things. So there's another board over here. I've got another chance of looking at a QR code. Let's look at the English version of this. Uh, this is another uh, fine arts department board and what they have typically done is uh, put QR codes along the bottom here and uh, that takes us off to a video. Let's have a look, see if it 
takes us off to a video. Well, that's a very nice little video they've done. Uh, the video speaks uh, about uh, the words here and elaborates a little bit more uh, about the, uh, the current use, uh, which is uh, about uh, people laying offerings now in uh, modern day. But, uh, it shows it in a, a drier state than it is today. Wow, that's fascinating. Well, now I've got all excited again because I've left that place over there. Um, I'm on to the site, as it says in Gary Harbottle's book, Harry, Harry, Gary Harbottle Johnson's book, uh, from site 19, this, uh, what, Pat Noy, I'm now going to site 20. Well, site 20 in the book isn't actually a temple. Uh, it's all about the city boundaries. And uh, in Gary Harbottle Johnson's book, he talks about the uh, city walls uh, and the moat, uh, the south uh, moat, uh, the south, how do you call it, defences. He speaks a little bit about it. <laughs> uh, of all the remnants of the city defences, this location is the most disappointing. Tantalising glimpses are seen inside a coppiced thicket alongside the road and patches of different differentiation between embankment and ditch are sometimes evident however the whole site is so badly overgrown and therefore suffering erosive damage that i suspect it will not be long before the adjacent farmer levels the thicket and cover, converts it into either a lamyite or a rice cultivation the fine arts department marker pole directional sign and descriptive plinth are all missing or lost in the undergrowth uh, and it takes a practiced eye to spot the telltale signs of medieval earthworks. Well, let's go and find those medieval earthworks. What we're talking about here is, is this sort of arrangement here. Uh, all around the city there would have been a wet moat, so a low area, then an embankment and then a low area again, and then a further embankment, and then inside the city. So a, a little bit like uh, what we see in many places around the world, that uh, this is what Gary says here in Thai Burmese border, there's still some there now, and also uh, in the third or fourth century, Romano British hill forts uh, were very much like this uh, in, in Europe, uh, whereby you had a palisade fencing along the top and to keep the intruders out, and you had a water in front. Now this water, this was from the ping. And then of course, uh, when the ping rose and this became eroded, it flooded this area too. Let's go and find that um, area, uh, which is uh, site 20. And if we look on his little uh, map that he's done here, uh, and uh, I'm gonna go and have a look at uh, where it shows you here, just to show you, see if what the developments have been. I came here a year ago and uh, you could hardly see anything maybe it's changed today and they've cut some uh, of the uh, of the growth back but you can see here this is a sort of a, a slashed line here but there's also a slashed line here and that is uh, something I'll also show you today along this road here uh, would have been an embankment and you'd have had the, the waterway out there and here an embankment and then you've had a dip and then inside you'd have had a higher embankment well as you can see much as of that has all been eroded and taken away let go over the centuries and now it's uh, inundated when place floods buildings are off the ground to stop the buildings from flooding and uh, it's just orchards and this is a um, lamb yai orchard another one over there plenty of water on the ground and this is a residence of somebody which is uh, yeah it's got a lot going on uh, but here uh, is a possible marker that the fine arts department left not sure um, it looks old it's got a funny inscription on it i don't um, recognize what it says but um, let me go around the back of it and see what it says at the back. What does it say? Nothing. It's gone missing. There's a sign 
that was there and that's all been taken away oh well so anyway that's all that's left of it now which is uh, very attractive hmm wonder what that means let's go and find the uh, the western boundary I can show you a bit more of that and that's a bit more interesting okay so well I've come over to this straight road here and this is over on the west side of the city and uh, I'm adjacent to Wat Pupia. This is the red marker on this little map. Uh, this is Wat Pupia, and this is a famous uh, haunted uh, ruin. And uh, I'm not there yet, that's number 29. So we'll come back to that another time. But I want to come back to this road. And when I was here uh, doing the video for uh, earlier temples uh, covering earlier videos that I was doing on this series uh, I came here during the floods and at this point I was knee high uh, struggling to walk in water what you see here this road that's going up here would have been uh, part of the waterway outside the west side of the uh, palisade and um, you know the wet moat embankment. I've been doing uh, visits to uh, the uh, Ping River Monitor out at uh, uh, Narawat uh, Bridge the, and uh, the doing here a couple of videos about that. I'll leave that in the uh, link above and uh, you can check how they monitor the level of the water uh, and also to tell you now today uh, since last week it was 2.2 uh, today uh, it's round about the same it's gone up it, it went up and it's come back down again so we're not in flood threat right now but if the rain that we've had the last few days keeps up uh, we may well be uh, in for another surprise this year I don't think so but early days you never know it could happen but uh, this is what uh, Pupia. I should be doing this later on, uh, not today. Uh, this is number 29 on my list, and I'm only just now on number 20. Goodness me, I've got a few to do yet. So, stay with me. Oh, my lord. Well, sod's law, I just shot my camera off and uh, put it in the seat of my bike and this little guy came along and whipped up his rod. He'd caught a fish. Wow. Bloody carp. Zuzuna. Well, this is site number 21, and uh, I've come to what Ku Pardom. Uh, it was named after Pardom, the landowner uh, of the site, and its actual name has not been found in any historical records. The assembly hall is an open hall with no walls. Its roof is a multi-tiered receding roof with a double roof on each side. It has a front stairway with the rails in the shape of a uh, Hang Wan, or... Uh, now and only the base of the stupa is found it's a square base supporting two-tiered base with indented corners the ordination hall is a lana style open hall an important architectural element of this hall is the stucco of a dragon emerging from mouth of makara gary in his book here he's actually saying that this is just the same as it says on the board there named after the landowner because there were no records of the uh, temple but it says there is a Vihan aligned north northwest southeast with a large Lana style Chedi base to the north western end there are altars to the northwest sides of the Chedi and the westernmost seems still to be used for votive offerings so we can see there underneath the roof in the centre of the picture there, the votive offerings that are still present today. The Chedi displays remains of a double rebatted relic chamber. 
Whilst the Chedi of, is of Lana style, fine arts department date the Vihan to a later period, 16th to 17th centuries. However, given the hypothesis about flood dates in this book, the first half of the 16th century would seem to be more accurate. So, 1500s once again. The buildings and the altars are surrounded by a boundary wall in excellent condition. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a boundary wall this side, and I guess there must be... Yeah, there's another boundary wall on the other side. I'm going to try and walk over that way. Now, if you've got a good imagination, um, you could think that Wien Kum Kam was inundated by a tsunami, uh, a roll of a wave coming down the ping and inundating Wien Kum Kam all at once, flooded, everything gone, everything covered up, everything lost, and people had to move out, and it happened overnight. Um, well, <laughs> our experience has been uh, that doesn't happen here. Uh, it gradually creeps up on you. The water comes from the mountains downstream. Wow, look at some of these cars in here. <gasps> Big American jobs and... <gasps> wow. Ah, look at these. What a fascinating place. It's a body shop. <laughs> How wonderful is that? You know, the water would have gradually crept up on them and swamped them and made everything much like it is today with water around them. It wouldn't have come over very fast and just swamped them. So it's, it's a gradual time process. So you can imagine over decades people having to put up with it and slowly thinking, oh hell, let's move out of here, let's go somewhere else, let's do something different. An organised tour coming round on a motorised motorised bus. You can pick the tour up at the front of Wien Kum Kam and uh, do the tour around either in a pony and trap or on the uh, motorised vehicles. There, they're not electric. Um, this view here is the one that you're shown, and it's absolutely glorious, isn't it? Uh, to see the ruins on a dry day, obviously you can. Uh, see it even nicer but doesn't it look lovely with the the water around each of the ruined structures you can uh, actually organize tours uh, through uh, websites as well uh, Chiang Mai a la carte I'll leave a link in the description below also do tours uh, of this area and uh, the Chiang Mai a la carte uh, website has a lot of information about Chiang Mai and other tours that you can do around Chiang Mai but they do uh, a well-informed visit to I believe it's around about 13 temples here in Wian Kum Kam. These guys they do typically a, a, a schedule of around about nine temples uh, and as you are well aware I'm currently on my 21st uh, this is number 21 and there's a few more yet to go so there's a lot of temples that you don't get to see on these organized tours but um, you know you do get a, a good um, explanation and I believe uh, Chiang Mai a la carte do it by a well-spoken English guide as well so uh, check that uh, link out in the description well just like Gary Harbottle Johnson's book uh, located at the back of a lamb and mango orchard about 50 meters from the road uh, in the grounds of a house, number 74 stroke 1, directly opposite a tile and roof plumbing store and behind the white wall with a sliding gate. Wow, we've come inside the white wall with a sliding gate and uh, the site is invis invisible from the main road. It's about 200 metres outside of the west of the Wiang Kum Kam city wall. Well, this is a very sad looking building. Not only today with me here, uh, looking through water, over water at it, and there's two, four, six, seven dogs on the far side. Um, this building in Gary Harbottle Johnson's book is called Wat Ubosot. Uh, it's been named as the abandoned ordination hall, which has been located but not yet excavated. The visible ruin consists of a square base of modern year 2000 bricks. So on the top here he's saying, it's year 2000 and 
they've been replaced. Uh, they have replaced the original bricks, which we can see on the far side uh, across underneath that tree there. They've all just been lined up, just stacked there for a rainy day. Uh, oh dear. Just identifiable on the top of the square base are two corners of Lana style double rabatted lotus base for Chedi. So what we're looking at is over here in the corner and the corner over there, uh, the remnants of a lotus base for the Chedi. To the east side of it, but also unexcavated, is a 10 by 23 meter Vihan. Well, I'll be buggered if I could see that. Which is currently one and a half meters below the surface. It, it says it in this book, so I shouldn't have really bothered looking. There, are, there was evidence of altars to the west and south sides of the Chedi. There also uh, are not now visible. I'll read that again. There was evidence of altars to the west and south sides of the Chedi. They are also not now visible. So I'm reckoning what Gary's writing here is year 2000 discussion here, and then he's... He's actually punctuating it by saying in 2002 they are not now visible. During the excavations, some Hari Punchai Buddhist tablets were found and fine arts date the site to about 16th to 17th hundreds. Sorry, 16th to 17th centuries. So that's 15 to 16 hundreds. There is little to see at the site, which with the difficulty of finding it may make it unworthy for visitors until excavations are completed. Currently, it is not known if that is planned. Well, since Gary was here, maybe, 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 there is this plinth over here uh, that's been put here, and it's now called Wat Bot. Uh, and it says, this monument was buried very deep from the surface that it suffers from water lock problems. After the excavation and the restoration in 2000, 2001, the Department of Fine Arts decided to cover the area with sand to preserve the ruins. This area was earlier a mound of historical site. The local people believed that it was the ruins of an ordination, bot or ubosot, uh, of a deserted temple. Here, a large amount of Buddha tablets were found by looting. The Department of Fine Arts did an excavation of the ruins in 1999 through to 2000 and found traces of Vihara and a Chedi. The Vihara faces east and rectangular in shape, now only parts of the lotus-based pedestal with unadorned panel remain. The floor of the Vihara was made of bricks and then coated with lime. Traces of pillar bases were found made of laterite. At the back of the Vihara was a pedestal. The Chedi was situated behind the Vihara, now only the lowest square base remains. Altars were placed in the south and west of the Chedi. Important artifacts found from the excavation were a bronze tapering finial of a chedi, a stucco of divinity, of a divinity's head, a Buddha tablet, pieces of limed bronze terracotta and sandstone Buddha image. Moreover, ten brick inscriptions from the Fakam alphabets were found from its architectural style and artifacts found at the site. This temple is dated 16th, 17th centuries. Well, so there we go. We are looking at what Ubersot number nine, and where we are right now is number nine. This is the ping, number nine. So the old moat used to come down here, the outside wall along the outside here. So outside of it. So there we have it. Uh, more proof that this uh, area didn't just stop functioning uh, when King Mengrai left. It didn't just flood and get covered over and stop. This particular building was built two, maybe 200 years after uh, Mengrai was here. So it didn't just cease to be once Mengrai left. Quite amazing. I have, I'm done for today because I'm I, I'm, I'm literally getting eaten by the mosquitoes that are in these orchards. 
I'm looking forward to bringing you more in this series. Uh, I am happy to have brought you more. Uh, I've got uh, half a dozen more to give you of these temple sites and uh, they are fascinating to have a look at and tell you about. So if you've not looked at it already, I'll leave a uh, link in the description to the playlist uh, of this series. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you are in Chiang Mai, you can check these places out yourself and find them of interest as I do. Uh, fascinating to see the history that's gone before and a little bit sad that it's uh, so, on the one hand, neglected, but lost because of time. Take care. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.